In the 2010s, much like today, it was really common for high school kids to want to be YouTubers. It's more common now than it was back then, but still, I think at just about every school, probably every 100 kids or so, there was one kid who was like, I'm gonna be famous from YouTube. And there was a particular Canadian girl who felt inspired by the rise of Justin Bieber, who had created YouTube videos that went super viral and he'd become an overnight international superstar. She wanted to do the same. So she started posting cover videos on YouTube regularly. In real life, her peers thought that this was kind of silly and they began harassing and bullying her. She had always been a little bit different. She'd always felt like she couldn't really relate to people her age. And so she found more and more that she was turning away from trying to create these real life friendships with her peers and diving more into the validation that she was receiving online. Even though her videos weren't going crazy viral or anything, she was getting a lot of positive feedback. There were people telling her, you're so beautiful, you're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. You have an incredible voice. I just know you're gonna be famous someday. And of course, there were always the comments of people being like, commenting here before she blows up. This stark contrast between the real life bullying that she was facing and the online praise that she was garnering made it seem abundantly clear that one of these groups of people was for her and one wasn't. Unfortunately, not everybody online comments positive things because they have positive intentions. Many of the people who were showering this girl with compliments were doing so because they were trying to win over her trust and confidence. This is a common tactic used by groomers. For those of you who don't know what grooming is, it is when you train or prepare somebody for an express purpose. Most commonly associated with adults who interact with minors and try and sort of prime them to trust them and think, I would never do anything bad to you. I'm the person that you should go to. I keep your secrets, therefore you should keep mine. Usually with the intended goal of exploitation of said minor. And unfortunately in the 2010s, this is when a lot of teenagers were still relatively unsupervised online. There wasn't a lot of digital media literacy as far as their parents and their peers were concerned. So people just didn't have as solid of an understanding as they do today for what is and isn't a digital red flag. And unfortunately, in order for people to go through some sort of massive shift in perspective, as far as these things are concerned, there usually has to be a landmark case. And a landmark case is when something happens that is so big, either it's famous or it's extreme, that it turns everybody's attention to a little known issue and makes it mainstream. Unfortunately, this 11 year old YouTuber would be that landmark case. This is the story of how one 11 year old girl would become the poster child for internet safety, cyberbullying, and teenage. This is the story of Amanda Todd. and Merry Christmas. I can't believe that I've been posting twice a week for two months now almost. That's kind of crazy because I did start my Spooky Saturday series in October of 2023 and we're already at the end of December. What the heck? Thank you guys so much for subscribing. If you haven't subscribed already, you know what to do. Before we get further in this video, I have two important disclaimers. One, as always, here's a trigger warning. This video is going to include exploitation of minors. It's going to include mentions of CP. It's going to include extreme bullying. It's going to include cyberbullying, and it's going to include the unaliving of a young person. If you do not feel like you can mentally handle any of those subjects right now, don't. Oh my gosh, it's totally fine. You guys are so supportive and I really appreciate you guys being here for me, but don't do so at the sake of your own mental health, please. The second thing I wanna say is the perpetrator involved in this case has made it abundantly clear at this point in time that they really love the notoriety and the infamy that they've received from being connected to this case. Therefore, I'm not gonna be showing any pictures of this person throughout the course of this deep dive and I'm not gonna be using their real name. This video is about Amanda Todd. She is the only name that we need to walk away from this case truly remembering. And I just don't have any interest in adding to this person's clout 
you could say, and therefore we're gonna be using a pseudonym. A lot of times when YouTubers in the true crime community use pseudonyms, it's because there's fear of potentially being sued. I just wanna make it clear that that's not the case. If you really wanna know more details about this person, you can obviously find it just by looking up Amanda Todd's case, but for the sake of this video, I'm going to be referring to the perpetrator in question as Joe. In order to tell this story right, we need some background on Amanda Todd because she really did seem like an incredible person. And I'm, I'm not just saying that because she's the victim of this case. It really seems like she was really dynamic and unfortunately deeply misunderstood. Amanda was always a natural performer. From a very young age, she would put on one woman shows in her house, she would sing covers, she would learn choreography, and she would always make her parents film it on camera for her. She just loved being in that spotlight and she loved making people happy with her performances. In early elementary school, it wouldn't be an overstatement to say that she was sort of a class clown. She was a classic case of a kid with ADHD who was acting out, but not because they were a bad kid just because it can be boring to sit still in school all day and it can alleviate a lot of that body tension that people with ADHD struggle with. If you can talk to whoever's sitting next to you or you can doodle on your paper or you can make little jokes. And it was common for Amanda to cause her entire class to bust out laughing. Granted, sometimes they weren't laughing with her, but they were laughing at her. But Amanda didn't care, she knew this. Her parents talked to her about it because they were a little bit worried that maybe she just didn't know that some of these kids were making fun of her. And they just tried to gently broach the topic with her. And she said, oh, mom, dad, I don't care. I know that some of them aren't laughing with me, but I don't care if they're laughing with me or at me. She just liked that she was getting some sort of reaction because like I said, she had that performer's mentality. She knew like, I'm not for everybody, but some of these people are laughing with me and I'm really just doing it for that. Unfortunately, this mindset just wouldn't stick. As time went on, she started to notice that the ratio between people who were laughing with her and people who were laughing at her was shifting and it wasn't in a favorable direction. She started to develop pretty severe social anxiety at a really early age. And this was a direct result of the bullying that she was experiencing at school. Her parents noticed that she suddenly became a lot more socially withdrawn. This is when she started to really dive into the internet. She was trying to seek some sort of social validation and connection and she knew she wasn't getting that at school. So she started posting really regularly on social media and started uploading YouTube covers. Even though her peers were making fun of her, it didn't matter. She knew that she had that star power and she wanted that fame. She thought to herself, I'm gonna be just like Justin Bieber. All it takes is one video blowing up, people will see me, I'll get signed to a record label and then everyone will wanna be my friend. At this point in time, she's only 11 years old and this is still sort of early internet days, so her parents didn't have a super strong understanding. That being said, it seems like her mom was a little bit more anxious about her online activity than her dad, and she seemed to keep a little bit more of an eye on her. It got to a point where Amanda asked her mom, like, mom, I really want a webcam for my computer. That way I can talk to people live and I can sing my covers in front of a live audience. Carol was like, no, <laughs> you're 11, you don't need a webcam. Like that sounds like something that we can get you in a few years if you're still interested in doing this. Plus at this point in time, webcams were like a little pricey too. So. It just seemed like it could potentially be unsafe and it's a decent amount of money. So Carol was like, mm, let's cross that bridge when we come to it. And that bridge, we don't need to cross today. Eventually Amanda would end up switching her primary residence so that she was with her dad, not because of this webcam thing, but just because that was the way the cookie ended up crumbling. And when she was with her dad, she ended up asking him the same thing. I really want a webcam so that I can talk to people online and I can perform for a live audience. Her dad was a little bit more with it tech wise where he was like, okay, you know, like I could see the value in that, but he still was worried about her online activity. So he was monitoring it at this time relatively closely. He wouldn't go in and read every single one of her messages, but he would look at what website she was going to and try and just get a general idea of what it was that she was doing. And from his perspective, it all seemed within the realm of normal young kid curiosity, and he didn't see any red flags at this moment in time. However, after the implementation of the webcam, Amanda became infinitely more obsessed with creating online friendships. It was the sole source of her social validation at this point in time. She was transitioning from elementary school to middle school, so I'd imagine there's a little bit of a thought there of like, okay, well, you know, maybe at my new school, things are gonna be a little bit different, 
but still, she knew for a fact there were people online that liked her and were nice to her, whereas school was more of a toss-up, and so far, she hadn't had good experiences. At the time that Amanda was in seventh grade, she had made a friend who was an adult man online. He was really complimentary, he always asked her to vent to him about her problems, and she was happy to do so because she was still getting bullied at school. It was very obvious to, let's call him Joe, that Amanda was highly insecure. And when he knew that she was getting bullied at school and she didn't really have any friends, he used that to his advantage. He did everything that he could to make her feel safe and supported and be there for her and validate her feelings and tell her things like, they just don't get it, they're gonna look back on this years later and they're gonna regret the way they've treated you. Trust me, I've been through the same thing. As an adult, I know how these things go. This is just how it always is when you're an incredibly talented and unique person. Just don't worry about what they think. Haters are gonna hate. Oh, also, um, you should flash me. Amanda would just sort of shrug it off because 90% of what Joe was saying was positive and validating and the things that she thought from watching Disney Channel friends were supposed to say to friends. But that 10% was a lot of pressuring from Joe for her to just flash her webcam really quick. So she felt like, mm, 90-10 split. I'll take it. It's better than any of my other friendships. So she would just sort of shrug it off and try and avoid it, even though he would bring it up kind of all the time. At this point in time, Joe is Amanda's only real friend, unfortunately. And after months of validating her and listening to her vent and helping her solve her problems to the best of his ability, he drew a line in the sand. He said, listen, Amanda, I'm not going to be here and be your friend and support you if you're not going to be a good friend to me. I'm gonna stop talking to you if you don't flash me on webcam. Just do it for a second, just one second. Like what's the worst that could happen? Obviously this is incredibly manipulative and messed up and of course he knows exactly what he's doing. This guy's a predator. He knows what he's doing is wrong. He's been doing this the entire time and he knows that Amanda is confused at this point in time, that she doesn't have very many other friends to compare this to. She doesn't know fully what is and isn't normal. And even though she's a little uncomfortable, he knows that he's her only friend and she probably doesn't want to risk that. And unfortunately, that bet paid off. When threatened with the loss of her only friend, Amanda finally agreed, okay, I'll flash the webcam really quick. And she quickly lifted up her shirt and it was over with. She felt like, okay, now he'll stop pressuring me about this and I can keep my friend. We both win. About a year later, Amanda had sort of moved on from Joe. She would still talk to him every once in a while, but she'd made a lot of other internet friends, and most of those other internet friends weren't pressuring her to flash her webcam. And they were still being there for her, and they are still validating her. So she had expanded her digital social circle, and she was feeling a lot more confident in herself. One day, she gets a Facebook friend request from someone that she doesn't know. But this isn't the most uncommon thing. In fact, a lot of the people that she's been friends with online are people that she didn't originally know, and she doesn't really have any sense of digital stranger danger. So she looks at the request and she sees, oh, there's a DM alongside it. She sees a message that says, I have your topless pics and I'll send them to everyone you know if you don't put on a show for me. In addition to that, the DM included a list of her entire friends and family. This included peripheral family members, like second cousins and stuff. Amanda was confused when she saw this message, especially with the list of everybody that she knows. It didn't even occur to her that when she had flashed Joe, that that video could have been screen recorded. She trusted him, I mean, he was her friend, right? She didn't know this person, and she didn't think Joe would screenshot, let alone send these intimate photos or videos to a total stranger. That just didn't make sense, that's not what friends do. All she could think was, how would this person even have access to something like that? Like what, maybe they hacked his computer or something, like while we were on webcam and they screen recorded it? I don't know, that sounds really hard. I just, I don't know, like none of this makes sense to me. I don't know what to do. Mind you, this is like a really young girl also. So a lot of adults, honestly, when confronted with messages like this would probably panic. So imagine that you're in middle school. That's a nightmare. More than that, her online life was almost completely separate from her real life. So when she saw this list of people that she knows in the real world, friends, family, classmates, 
and she saw it like heavily associated with her internet activity, that just seemed like two worlds colliding. It just didn't seem real to her. It didn't seem like something that could happen. I mean, the internet was her safe space after all. She was used to people bullying her in real life, but she'd never been harassed online in any sort of significant way. So after she thought about this for a while, she came to the conclusion that this person must be lying. And she decided to call their bluff. And for her, that looked like not accepting the friend request and not responding to the DM. Unfortunately, they were not bluffing and her video was immediately sent to the Daily Capper. What is the Daily Capper? The Daily Capper doesn't exist anymore and it definitely needs some context, especially because the word cap has really changed socially in the last like decade. At this point, capping wasn't the way that we think of it now. Currently, if you hear somebody say like, you're capping, that's cap, it's like Gen Z slang for you're lying. But back in the 2010s, it meant like screen capping, like a screenshot on your computer. So the daily capper, it wasn't somebody who was like trolling online and like lying the way you might assume it is based off of the title. The daily capper was a digital pet ring and unfortunately it was really organized it wasn't just a blog and a digital news source air quote news source it was a whole online community so people who are a part of the daily capper community would devote all of their free time to befriending minors online and grooming them so that they could then pressure them into exposing themselves online once the minors had exposed themselves online and these perpetrators were able to secure screen caps which is let's not mince words, CP, these images and videos would be sent to the Daily Capper blog and air quote news show. It's actually really insane to think that this was something that existed for as long as it did. They produced a blog TV news show where they had a cartoon news anchor and the news just consisted of exposing these minors. Every single time that they would upload and do air quote news updates, they would spotlight different minors who had been exploited and encourage their community to further harass and exploit these minors. It basically operated like an insanely predatory fandom. They used a Twitter account to link to a bunch of minors' tiny chat accounts, which is like an early form of social media, so that this community could go out and try and connect with them. This would be minors who had yet to expose themselves online. They had curated a list of kids that Daily Capper community wanted to see exposed. And this entire community would make that their mission. So it's bad enough to have one or even two adults attempting to groom you. This is a community of thousands of people. A lot of these kids would be located through video chat sites as well. So imagine if you're at a sleepover, you go on chat roulette, you go on Omegle, somebody just happens to see you for a split second before you skip to the next person, and then they devote hours or weeks or months into trying to locate your social media, eventually find it, send it to this insane ring, and then thousands of adults are now suddenly coming out of the woodwork trying to take advantage of you. It's really the stuff of nightmares. In addition to having a digital blog and online channel, they actually produced three physical issues of a magazine that exclusively contained CP. And I have no idea how this community was able to exist, let alone thrive, for so long. I understand that internet safety wasn't a major concern, but it's just actually insane that this community was able to have the reach that it did without getting immediately shut down. I mean, now something like that would, would never be able to exist on the part of the internet that most people have access to. It would have to be on the dark web. But this wasn't on the dark web. This was just on the straight up internet. Like this was on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. And it didn't die until 2010. I was a minor in 2010. It was still active when I was somebody who could have been on one of these lists. I could have been targeted. I was like the, the ideal age for this group, honestly. It's so gross and like terrifying and I feel really lucky that that never happened to me or anybody that I know. They even had a digital award show. Like I'm telling you, this community was like alive and well. Part of this award show is they would have like cam of the year, blackmailer of the year. These are all legitimate awards that they gave out. It's insane. It's actually insane. 
a legitimate army of adults who were just targeting children online, grooming them into exploiting themselves, and then mocking them for being stupid for the fact that they were successfully groomed, as if that's not the whole goal, as if they don't already know that this is an incredibly effective methodology. It's just like so disgusting and sadistic. Unfortunately, this brings us back to Amanda. Because Amanda ignored the Facebook DM and chose to call their bluff, her video was immediately sent to the Daily Capper. I wanna pause here really quick. I don't think that Amanda could have avoided this. I, I don't think her reaction actually matters. I think if she had responded and agreed to the blackmail and given another webcam show, like the blackmailer was asking for, who was, by the way, Joe, just contacting her through another fake catfish account. I, I think it's, it's pretty obvious that if she had exposed herself any further on webcam, those images and videos would have just been used to blackmail her more and they all would have eventually been sent to the Daily Capper anyway, because that's the express purpose of this entire thing. I just wanna make that clear before people victim blame and say she should have done this, she should have done that. I actually don't think she could have done anything. Once that video was out there, unfortunately, it was out there forever. The Daily Capper on their animated news show posted a picture of Amanda's face and it explained the entire situation that she had exposed herself on webcam, making fun of her, exploiting her, and then in the description it linked to a blog post that Joe had created where if you click the link, it would take you and it would show you a GIF of Amanda exposing herself on webcam. Now, thousands of people had access not only to this CP of her, but to her name and her face and were being explicitly encouraged to go harass her and cyberbully her and send this CP to anyone and everyone who knows her. Amanda had no idea that her video had been sent to the Daily Capper. While all of this was unfolding, she was actually asleep. At four in the morning, Amanda was abruptly woken by police in her bedroom. They told her about the blog. They informed her that CP of her had been not only released onto the Daily Capper and the internet as a whole, but had been specifically sent to anyone and everyone that knows her in real life, even peripherally, through their social media accounts or emails. This included staff members from her school. This included teachers. This included other kids from her school's parents. And of course, it included other kids from her school. And of course, it included her own parents and her own extended family. And it wasn't just being sent in GIF format. It was being sent through multiple channels to make sure that as many people saw Amanda exposed as possible. And unfortunately, this was all happening during Christmas break. The police became involved because friends and family of Amanda who had received these images immediately contacted authorities out of concern. This was, of course, the worst case scenario for Amanda. She's only 11 years old. It's Christmas break. She thinks that she's about to have this great fun time. She already felt isolated at school and now she felt more socially isolated than ever. And keep in mind, her social anxiety has been growing over the years because she is still getting consistently bullied at school. So now she feels like people who are already making fun of her now have more ammunition than ever. And people who weren't making fun of her before now have also seen her exposed. Not just everybody that she knows has seen these photos, but everybody her parents know that she doesn't even know have seen these photos, their coworkers, their friends. And on top of that, thousands of strangers online who she doesn't know have also seen these pictures of her as well. So she feels like anybody and everybody on earth has seen them and there's really no escaping that. Now when she went online, instead of getting validation and compliments and creating new friendships, all that was happening was she was being slut shamed by thousands of strangers every single day. It seemed that nobody had any empathy for Amanda and they were completely inappropriately approaching this. Instead of people calling it what it was, which was exploitation of a child, people were acting like she was fast, like she was acting out, like she had done something wrong, which isn't the case. Even if she had, made a mistake. She's at an age where people are exploring themselves, where their bodies are changing, and children should be able to interact with themselves and their bodies in a safe way and in a private way. Instead of people approaching her with understanding and empathy, all that was happening was the harassment was increasing. She was diagnosed with extreme depression, and now she had developed a panic disorder. 
And as she's processing this, she turns one year older. She's only 12 years old. She starts drinking and doing drugs because it is the only way that she feels like she can get even a moment of relief from all of this pain and anxiety and torment that she's experiencing from every single direction in her life. It's inescapable at this point. Her parents are at a loss for what to do. They're not judging her, they love her, they understand that she is a victim. They are really the only ones who are in Amanda's corner at this point in time. So they go, listen, we've just gotta get out of this community. Right now, we can't do anything about what's happening in the online community, but we can move out of this community where people are treating our daughter who is a victim, like it is her fault, which it is not. And so they were not down with the victim blaming and they're like, we're switching schools. We probably should have switched schools earlier. It turned out that this was actually a great move for Amanda. So a year in the future, she's finally making some friends in real life. She's finally feeling a little bit better. She's not leaning on substances the way that she was anymore. And she's finally like, getting a bit of a sense of ease. She's not looking over her shoulder every single day, wondering if she's gonna see somebody who has seen it, wondering if Joe's gonna somehow find her in real life. And of course, when she's finally feeling a little bit of relief, she gets a message from Joe, but she doesn't know it's from him. It's from another catfish account. The message is the same as the one that started all of this. It's a threat, almost, identical to what was originally said. I have the videos of you. I'm gonna send it to anyone and everyone you know if you don't put on a show for me for 15 minutes. Now, who knows if Amanda would have reacted differently to the message this time because before she even got a chance to see it, Joe had sprung into action. From his catfish account, he immediately started requesting all of the kids at her new school, all of the staff members at her new school, all of the local parents at her new school. And while he was doing this, he was sending DM requests with Amanda's pictures. All over again, the bullying immediately starts. The shaming immediately starts. Amanda goes into a downward spiral. She falls back into addiction, immediately relapses. Her parents know what they need to do this time. They're not wasting any time. They pull her out of school. She's now at her third school in just a couple years. And while she's there, she starts talking to an old guy friend that she hadn't talked to in a couple years, mainly because she didn't really trust anybody from her past. But he's talking to her and he's saying, listen, like, I don't judge you for any of that. In fact, I've actually always kind of liked you. And they start bonding, they start talking every single day. For once, somebody in real life, instead of someone online, is telling her the things that she wants to hear. That she's beautiful, that she's cool, that she's nice, that she's smart, that her poetry is awesome. Because Amanda was really creative, by the way. The one thing that she used to compartmentalize through all of this was poetry and songwriting. And I'm a strong believer in the the mental health benefits of an artistic outlet, especially if you have some sort of PTSD or complex PTSD or are undergoing an active trauma. It is a really great way to break down those feelings in, in ways that can't really be expressed in typical language sometimes. She's finally feeling comfortable again. And more than that, she actually writes in one of her poems that she feels loved. She feels like someone actually sees her like someone cares and she's never had that feeling before. And even though he's got a girlfriend, she tells herself, you know, like, yeah, like that's not good, but this is also the only time that anyone has ever showed any real interest in me. This is the only situation I've ever had where like there's potential that it could go somewhere. And when you're so like emotionally starved like that, I'm obviously not condoning being the other woman or the other man in any sort of situation, but let's not act like we can't understand how she got from A to B, even if we don't agree with it. This is somebody who is like socially starved and has been going through such terrible things. And let's not overlook the obvious. She's been leaning on alcohol and drugs to process all of these traumas because that gives you a dopamine hit. And love also gives you a very strong dopamine hit. So for somebody like Amanda, who's been struggling with addiction because she's like in the trauma trenches, it's not surprising that she would become immediately attached to somebody who's giving her romantic validation, even if those conditions are not ideal. Even though he has a girlfriend, this is the closest Amanda has ever felt 
to social acceptance. He tells her over text that his girlfriend's out of town on break and that she should come over. Amanda comes over to his house and they do the deed. She writes even more poems about how incredible she feels that this is like the best time of her life, that she's finally happy. And unfortunately that happiness would be incredibly short-lived because just a week later, his girlfriend would find out and confront her at school with a crowd of not only 15 of her friends, but with the boyfriend as well. He wasn't on Amanda's side. He was standing behind his girlfriend, encouraging her to confront Amanda for what she had done, as if he wasn't an active participant, as if he's not the one who cheated. In front of everyone at school, they corner her. They start shaming her. They start calling her mean names. They start telling everyone what she did, saying that she's gross, that she's desperate, all of the worst things that you could possibly hear in private, let alone in front of your entire school. And at this point in time, Amanda did have a couple friends at her new school, but they were notably silent. When she looked out into the crowd for help, if somebody was gonna come like defend her, they weren't even close to standing up. They did not wanna get involved. And if they were gonna get involved, it wasn't gonna be on Amanda's side. At one point, while all of these girls and the boyfriend are yelling at Amanda and calling her names. A boy across the room says, just hit her already. And that's when it begins. The girlfriend starts physically assaulting Amanda in front of everybody and no one helps her. It gets so bad that Amanda eventually has to run away and hide in a ditch where she stays until her dad eventually finds her. I feel so bad for her parents in this whole situation just because they must have felt so helpless between the bullying and the online harassment. I just like, I can't even imagine what that must have been like for her father to find her in that ditch. And so he takes her home, he cleans her off. He tries to tell her, you know, Amanda, it's okay. Amanda is convinced that this is exclusively her fault, that it's because she made a mistake. And he tells her, listen, people make mistakes. Even if you did something that you regret, that doesn't mean that you should be able to be like essentially stoned by the masses in front of your entire school. And then after the assault, forced to hide in a ditch, Amanda. Like this is just not normal. But unfortunately, all of his support ended up falling on deaf ears because that night, Amanda would attempt to take her own life in the form of drinking bleach. Fortunately, Amanda's father found her before it was too late and rushed her to the ER where her entire system is flushed out. And luckily she is saved with minimal damage. Just a couple days into her recovery, the news of what had happened to her is posted in social media. And instead of comments of condolences or support or even regrets for how these kids had treated Amanda, the comments are just flooded with hate. Almost every other comment is either a joke, asking if she washed the mud off from the ditch yet. People were posting pictures of different bleach brands and asked, did you try this one? Maybe it didn't work because you tried the wrong brand. And even the girlfriend of the boy that she had hooked up with had commented that she wished she had just died instead. At this point, it's obvious what her parents have to do. They have to move her to another school again. Before Amanda starts at her fourth school, she deletes all social media because clearly the internet is not her friend. But at this point, it didn't matter. At this point in the 2010s, the social media like Facebook had become so mainstream that every single person that she knew was online regardless of if she was or not. Her reputation could easily precede her. And even if kids who had bullied her at her previous schools hadn't tried to contact kids at her new school, it didn't matter because her stalker, Joe, would. And of course, every single time that he did, he would forward videos and pictures of Amanda. He would actually endear himself to her peers by creating an account pretending to be somebody their age, pretending to be a young boy. And he would friend random people from the school. But at this point in time, people were becoming a little bit more skeptical of strangers on Facebook. So when asked why he was requesting someone who he didn't know, he would simply reply saying, oh, I'm about to transfer to this school in the next two weeks. So I just wanted to try and reach out and get to know some people before I get there. So I'm not a total loser on the first day of school. This sounded believable enough to most of Amanda's classmates and 
nobody really suspected anything, so they agreed to accept these friend requests. And of course, in very short order, Joe would then forward the pictures and the videos of Amanda, saying things like, do you know this girl? She went to my old school. Look at what a she is. He would also pose as a social worker, and he would send the photos and videos to staff members at Amanda's school and to other parents, saying that he was simply concerned and he was trying to investigate a case involving this content. Not as believable as a lie, but it didn't matter because the damage was already done. After Amanda's attempt, she began committing a lot of self-harm, and she was cutting almost daily. Because of this, she was put on antidepressants, but unfortunately, she would use her antidepressants to attempt to take her life once again via overdose. She was in counseling, but it seemingly wasn't working, at least not fast enough, because she was still self-harming and she was still attempting. Seemingly out of options, Amanda felt like maybe she should just turn back to the internet for support. So on September 7th of 2012, she made what is now considered an infamous video. At this time, there was a YouTube format that was really popular where you would use note cards. It's sort of like how TikToks now have like a couple sentences of captions and then it'll move on and they'll tell a story that way. But people did it physically with note cards and Sharpie. And so they would just silently sit there and they would hold up note cards, Love Actually style, and they would just move them until they had delivered their entire message. So Amanda uploaded a video of her essentially chest up, note cards in hand, black and white, explaining everything that she had gone through. She wanted somebody to understand her. She was looking for connection. And in the caption of the video, she explained that she didn't make this video for sympathy or for people to feel bad for her. She made this video to explain that she's been through a lot, but she's still here. And she was hoping that it would serve as a source of inspiration and maybe even for connection between other kids who've experienced similar things or are having a hard time. And that maybe this could be a way for her to meet some people like that and they could be there for each other and it could create some semblance of support. But unfortunately, the video would go unnoticed. And just one month later, on October 10th of 2012, Amanda would end her life via hanging. Before we move on, I feel compelled to include a bias disclosure. I was bullied my entire life, from elementary school all the way up to college, which is insane. Who's getting bullied in college? Me. Anyway, I was bullied my entire life, so this next part is just like very difficult for me to reconcile with and it's probably going to bleed through. Um, this entire story is like very triggering for me in general as, as somebody who's not only been bullied but is also a survivor and has also experienced abuse. To see that just the fact that like literally nobody cared is really just very hard for me to even talk about. Um, so I just want to make that clear. I know that these are our kids who were bullying Amanda in school. Digitally, a lot of adults were bullying her, and for that, you know, that that's like a whole other thing, but it is hard for me not to feel like just a, a lot of like upset feelings towards people who I know were my, minors as well at the time. After Amanda had taken her own life, these kids who had bullied her at her last four schools suddenly had all the sympathy in the world. They were commenting things like, she'll be missed. People who were punching her in the face and calling her a s were saying, she'll be missed. She was such a kind soul. She was such a great person. Where was this energy when she was alive and she could hear you? Like, it, it's literally the switch up of the century. And I get that. These are kids who are immature and their frontal lobe hasn't developed and a lot of them have such low empathy levels at this stage in their development that they basically are like sociopathic. And like I know that sometimes for somebody who is still learning and growing, like I know that we're not all created empathetically equal. I know that some kids are highly sensitive from an early age and that can be for a whole host of different reasons or can really be the result of a lot of trauma. I was always like a very sensitive and like empathetic and aware kid and I think that for me 
as like this isn't for everybody, but for me in particular, I'm sure that had a lot to do with the fact that I was also feeling socially isolated and left out and I knew people were being mean to me and I didn't want to perpetuate that energy. So I understand that kids who have never been on that side of it, it might be harder for them to, you know, get it and act appropriately until there has been some sort of major upset in their lives. But I just really hate that it seemingly came at the cost of of Amanda's life. And I also know that I'm sure there were people who were just virtue signaling while this was happening. I'm sure a lot of the people who were teenagers when this happened, I'm sure they carry a lot of guilt. I, I'm not gonna speak for all of them, but I'm sure a lot of people carry a lot of guilt for the way that they treated Amanda. Not just because the story became so huge, but I know just in the last like five years of my life, and I know this is in large part, I'm sure, because I have a platform and maybe people who bullied me growing up having to, to see me pop up randomly. Maybe some of them are reaching out to me to apologize now because they want something. There's definitely been a couple where I can tell that might be the vibe. But I think a lot of people who are, have reached out to me to apologize are genuinely apologetic. And like seeing me pop up struck a chord in them where they're like, God, like, I really shouldn't have treated her like that. And I do, I'm not a grudge holder. I do respect and I do accept a lot of those apologies. Not all of them. Some people I can choose to like move on from without like forgiving them, you know? I'm sure that a lot of people, since Amanda's case is so extreme, live with a lot of guilt to this day. And I hate to be this guy, but that is actually what you get. That's the punishment for something like this. It's terrible, it can be life ruining, but Amanda doesn't have a life left to ruin. Her life was ruined, her life is done. I'm sorry for like ranting for a second there, but before I finish the story, I just needed to get that out. What really takes this story to another level, beyond the fact that all the people who used to bully her were now suddenly apologetic, was this video that she had made, her note card video just a month prior, now had gone incredibly viral because Given what had happened, it makes everything that she was saying a whole lot more serious. It was serious when she made the video, but people weren't really getting that. They weren't listening to her. It was falling on deaf ears. Now knowing what it would lead to just a month later, people were suddenly really seeing this video and they were finally hearing her. The message was finally coming through. The video became internationally viral with media outlets discussing it and circulating it with the context of cyberbullying, using it as a cautionary tale to parents like, hey, monitor your kids. They could be the victims or they could be the bullies. You need to make sure that your kids aren't experiencing this or perpetuating this. Both are things that you need to be aware of and you need to intervene. And I think for a lot of parents, it was like a huge shock because I remember like I was, I would have been a sophomore in high school when all of this was happening. I remember hearing about it. I remember my parents being like, this is why you don't have Facebook, because I didn't get Facebook till like senior year. They're like, this is why you don't have Facebook. You see what happens? You see what happens? And I was like, oh my God, actually, yeah. I think it was like a huge wake up call for a lot of parents who, at this point, like the internet was a little bit of an enigma to them. Like, you know, even though Facebook had gotten big, a lot of people who were late to the social media game, they were like, I still don't really get it. Like, you know, I don't really get, like, I don't know about all these chat rooms. I have no idea, like, how all, all of this works. And of course, Amanda's parents started getting flooded with interview invitations. They talked about how she was bullied at four different schools, and it never stopped. They talked about the influence her ADHD had on her upbringing. They talked about how she is a victim of exploitation, and yet she was being treated like she was just loose or something. And of course, they talked about all of her attempts leading up to the time that she actually committed. And on top of it all, they talked about how early on they went to the police about all of this. They went to the police about the online stalking. They went to the police about the circulation of CP. They went to the police about the harassment. And what did the police say? Nothing can be done. Of course, now that there's an international spotlight and there's millions and millions of outraged parents and educators and legal officials weighing in on this. Now, suddenly, the investigation can officially start. Because before this, there was no formal investigation. 
Because, again, they said they couldn't do anything. Suddenly, now, the investigation can start. Of course, everybody's feeling like this is too little too late because it is. Imagine you're the parents and suddenly after hearing for years that the police can't do anything, oh, they're doing it. They are, they actually are doing things. It's absolutely ridiculous. What really baffled most people about this case is how could the cops say that nothing can be done when this is a case of CP? You know, I know that a lot of times with stalking and harassment, it's a little bit harder to navigate, especially depending on the rules in different states. And I mean, now whenever something happens online, it's automatically federal um, because it just is automatically considered to, being, to be crossing state lines. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that that's the way we approach things now. But the police went to the media and they said that they were finally gonna start collecting evidence. Within 24 hours, because this stalking was so widespread and the, the net that had been cast of people who were contacted and sent photos and videos of Amanda was so broad, within just 24 hours, they received 400 credible tips. That's insane. After the public learned that the police's official advice to Amanda was just to get off Facebook, the vigilante group Anonymous decided to get involved. And after just a week, they came forward and they said that they had found Joe's true identity. Unfortunately, all of the evidence attached to this suspected Joe proved not to be legit. Unfortunately, this was after they had already doxed the wrong guy. But they said, fear not, we're gonna get back on the case, sorry, our bad. And then they soon came forward with a new man who they believed to be Joe. And after publicly doxing this person who was actually completely unrelated to the case and it turning out that Anonymous was incorrect once again, they agreed to leave the case to the official authorities and to back off. And I think pretty much everybody was cool with that. After Anonymous left the case, it would take authorities another two years before they could find the man who was truly responsible for everything that had happened to Amanda. Two years before they could bring Joe to justice. In January of 2013, Dutch police arrested a man in connection to a local case involving multiple minors. While Joe had been stalking Amanda, he devoted all of his free time outside of that to stalking other minors. And at some point in time, he had focused his crosshairs on a local Norwegian girl. But this girl wasn't having any of it. She knew that something was wrong with Joe and she reported him immediately. Luckily, she reported him before he could abuse her. Not everybody can be so lucky, and I really hope that nobody compares what this girl has done with Amanda because everybody's experiences and impulses are different. This girl may have had other experiences that made it easier for her to identify these red flags. She may have gotten lucky. We don't know. Luckily, the Dutch police took it seriously right away, which makes all the difference. When they traced the IP address, it led them directly to Joe's trailer. But even though they knew where it was coming from, they couldn't actually take any further action until Facebook agreed to get involved in the investigation. Facebook was like, okay, we're gonna do our own internal investigation first, then we'll link up at the end and we'll just like go over everything and then move forward from there. The cops agreed and that's basically what happened. During their investigation, Facebook found that Joe's phone number was linked to 86 different fake accounts, also known as catfish accounts, all of which were talking to minors specifically young girls, and all of them were somehow peripherally linked to Amanda Todd. This meant that Dutch police could then move forward and they could put spyware on Joe's computer. This move would result in the discovery of one of the biggest CP collections ever found. They found over 2,400 self-produced videos and pictures, all of which were partly encrypted. They found a drive with 5,800 bookmarked names, all of which belonged to potential victims. So this dude had like a list that he was just going down of people who he thought could potentially be vulnerable. He also saved a lot of his threats and would reuse them, just copy and paste. It was a motif of his that he would like commonly request three 15 minute videos, like shows as his go-to blackmail. His messages were all key logged and this led the police to find evidence that he was messaging multiple 11 year old girls a day. He was told by multiple children that his actions were making them contemplate taking their own lives, and he seemed to enjoy this. Even with the key logs and the spyware and all of the CP, Joe claimed that he was innocent. 
After his arrest, he released an open letter to the public. I wouldn't recommend reading it. It's a bunch of BS and also, I don't really care for his voice to be heard, and that's why I'm not gonna read it directly. But to give a summary of what he goes over, he basically spends most of the letter complaining, saying that he can't possibly have a fair trial because the Amanda Todd case has gone internationally viral. He claims that the IP tracing is actually really misleading because it really just leads to his neighbor's router and that router was unprotected and everybody in the trailer park was using it, so why should he be singled out? He also claims that because of this, anybody could come into the trailer park specifically just to use that router. And so it could have just been somebody who's passing through. Basically, he takes the approach of it could have been anyone. He also blames a lot of it on Facebook and says like Facebook's like out to get him for some reason. And then he ends the letter with a, a, a PS where he's like, PS, don't worry. Like that's the one thing I'm gonna quote is he said, don't worry. Don't worry about all the CP. I don't know how it got there. Bro said IDK as his defense. Also, he wrote this entire letter in English because he was trying to appeal to a Western audience, which I think is very telling. He goes to trial in 2017 over in Europe. He is rightfully convicted of internet fraud and blackmail, and then he's sentenced to 10 years in prison. But it doesn't stop there. He is then extradited to Canada because Amanda Todd is actually not his only Canadian victim. There was actually four other Canadian girls that he had terrorized and abused. His trial started in June of 2020, and by October 14th, he had been sentenced to 14 years. It just, with a case like this, like even if she didn't take her own life, when somebody is abused in this way, the wound is just lifelong. It's just, an, it's, a, it's a life altering experience it really sticks with you in a way that even though people can like explain it and they can tell you like the inner mechanisms of their mind and like just even if you're like the best communicator on the face of the planet, I feel like something like this is just so violating and otherworldly that it's almost impossible to accurately portray the depth of feeling that comes with something like this and like the ever-presentness of it in words. I often wish that like, when I was like a little kid, not to like trauma dump, I would always say that I wished my superpower could be that I could touch somebody and they could feel what I was feeling because I used to have a really hard time like explaining my emotions. When there's a case like this that involves a young person who has been systematically abused, the the depth of those wounds, like we just don't have the language to capture it. I, I just really don't think that we do. So even if Amanda had not taken her own life, her and all of his other victims, they have these lifelong wounds. And so I'm not a lawmaker, but it just seems to me like every time there's a case like this, the sentencing just always seems so unfair. Just never, it never feels like enough. I don't wanna talk about Joe anymore. I'd rather talk about Amanda's parents. Amanda's parents to this day are working really hard to keep her legacy alive. They wanna use what happened with their family as a cautionary tale so that they can do as much as they can to make sure that it doesn't happen to anybody else. Like I said, Amanda Todd's case is a landmark case and it has brought an incredible amount of visibility to these issues, but every year there are kids who are coming of age and every year there's a new set of children who are using the internet for the first time. So you can't talk about something like this enough because there's always going to be people who are ignorant to a story like this. And that's why you have to just, you have to just keep talking about it. The Todds primarily focus on bullying and exploitation of children, S word crimes, mental health. The Amanda Todd Legacy Foundation is a nonprofit that the Todds have created. It focuses on generating awareness. It focuses on real world prevention and education. And it's a nonprofit. So I'm gonna link it below this video. Please consider donating to their cause. It's a really important cause. And especially with the rise of iPad kids and the fact that the internet's clearly not going away, I think conversations like this are really important, especially because internet laws are being litigated right now. We don't have a lot of laws in place as far as the internet's concerned because it's a new area for us as a, as a species. And 
Amanda Todd's parents, they really do provide a lot of resources for kids who may be feeling alone and may be seeking out validation on apps like TikTok, you know, where I'm big. So I just feel like this is a really important cause and I wanna end on that. If you enjoyed this video, thank you so much for sticking to the end. I know it was like a really heavy, tough subject, but Spooky Saturdays aren't exactly about being light and being fun. They're about like the cruelty of the world. And for me, even though it's really hard to talk about a lot of these subjects, I just feel like they're really important. And you know, every day is somebody's worst day of their life. I know that on days that I've been having a really hard time, it makes a big difference if there's people around you who can even understand it on a level. You know, they don't have to like meet you at, at your feelings fully, but just like to have some sort of like touch point to go off of. And I feel like that's what I appreciate about the true crime community is it brings that to a lot of people. At least that's my approach. And I feel like there's a lot of other creators who take that same approach too. And I always appreciate it. So as always, if you're not subscribed already, go ahead and subscribe. I post a video like this every single Saturday, just a couple days before Christmas. So I hope everybody has happy holidays and gets to spend time relaxing, revitalizing themselves and being around the ones that they love. Thanks. Bye.